it's um, a little bit difficult to know where to begin after Jeremy's talk. I'm now, I'm now totally conscious about what to say at the beginning. Um, technology has come a long way, of course. Uh, and I suppose for me, where I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin with a confession. Um, and, and the confession is that I only joined Facebook all those years ago to find out what my son and daughter were up to in their lives. <laughs> they accepted me as friends, and within a week, they blocked me. <laughs> the plan did not work. And in the early days, I looked at Twitter, and I just didn't get it. I'm in a coffee shop. Here's a picture of a cake. It's nice. Why? Do we does the world really need this? And of course, since then, there's been something of an evolution in my thinking, as you will gather from, um, from the title of this talk. Uh, and I think technology has come a long way, and it's come on such a journey to the extent that many of us increasingly live out part of our lives with and through digital devices to a greater or lesser extent. And I accept, to me, it's to a greater extent. I'm addicted to this stuff and that's my problem. <laughs> but all of us live out part of our lives to some extent with and through digital devices. And I think this has profound implications for foreign and second language education because we live out our lives, of course, through and with language and languages, L1 and L2, and in some cases, L3 and in L4, and so on. So, from digital self and students to professional self and teachers, um, this is something of my journey, which I'd like to share with you, and I hope you'll find um, relevant and interesting. I've, if this works, are we turned on? Technology, turn it on. It's great when it works, isn't it, the technology? Isn't it just great when it works, and it's awful when it doesn't work? The last time I did a plenary with Jeremy present, I was in Bangladesh, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, and I had this amazing visual that I wanted to illustrate something with, and I pressed it, and there was just this blank screen. What do you do? You wing it, you get by it, don't you? Because spontaneity, it doesn't always go to plan. This is the plan at the beginning. If I don't get through all of this or I deviate, um, these, these are my intended outcomes for, 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 for this next hour. I want to reflect on and locate this debate about digital self, what it means for our students, what that means for how we use technology um, inside the classroom and beyond the classroom, and what it does or what it potentially means for us as teachers in our um, professional development. Because as I've moved away from thinking about students and learning and using technology outside the classroom and inside the classroom, my recent work over the past sort of couple of years has been on continuing professional development. Um, for us as teachers, as reflective teachers, as teachers who want to think about things, as teachers who want to access information, as teachers who want to share information with others, um, I think there are incredible opportunities and affordances. So I'm going to start at, with, with, with students uh, and learners and then move on to teaching and uh, continuing professional development. Uh, reflecting on the debate, defining our terms, and then moving on to why I think this matters. And I want to put an argument to you as to why I think it matters. Why it matters for um, what we do with our L2 students, and why it matters for our continuing professional development. So that's the plan. And here's the warmer. I'm going to show you two visuals. 
And I want you to have just a couple of minutes with the person sitting next to you, thinking about and reflecting on the um, similarities and the differences of these visuals in terms of accessing information and transmitting information. So what are the people in the visuals doing in terms of accessing information? What, if anything, are they doing in terms of transmitting information? Similarities and differences. One is a pre-internet paper-based medium. There they are. Does the laser work? It worked in the test run. And the other is Web2 digital base medium. With the person sitting next to you, similarities and differences in terms of accessing information, submitting information. Discuss. So my, I'm going to do my teacher gets the attention of the class in a minute by getting my keys out and going, Dak. do you ever do that? When you, wait, wait, I don't know. How, how do we end discussions? We start a discussion and it's going really well. Do we let the, les the rest of the lesson carry on or do we say, I've got my plan? Anyway, I've, I've interrupted and I've ended this because there are other things I want to talk about. Some feedback. Anybody? Anybody want to input? Yeah. They're both one-to-one -one mediums. Okay. Good, yeah, they're both one-to-one -one mediums. Other similarities, yeah, yes? Okay, other differences, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, let's face it, these people are reading yesterday's news, aren't they? Today's papers are always yesterday's news. Other similarities, other differences? Anyone else at the back? Yes? I, I can't quite hear you. Both text-based. They're both visual, they're both text-based. Possibly, possibly. Look at this guy, though. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a lot of text. The text is quite different, of course, because you've got linear text here, and that has implications for what we do in our classes about teaching reading skills. Linear text go from A to B to C to D to E, paper-based text. Um, if they are looking at text, and many of them probably are, it's hyperlinks, and it's probably not linear. Not all of them are reading text. Some of them are listening. Some of them are watching YouTube over here. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing I want, that, that, that in particular is what I want to focus on. There's a good chance that these people are in touch with someone else. They are interacting probably in some way, shape or form with others. 
They are making choices about what apps to use. They are probably making choices about what to read. Here you can choose what newspaper to buy. But once you've bought that newspaper, that's it. Here you've got loads of choice. You've got some kind of interaction going on. And the point I want to stress is they are living out a part of their lives with and through digital devices in their first language and invariably in many instances in an L2 and the dominant L2 globally is of course English and that I think is a game changer it's a game changer for how we think about technology and language education. It shifts things significantly. I've worked in, in, in technology and language education for a number of years, <laughs> 30 years. And the arrival of Web 2 and the affordances of Web 2, I think, is a huge game changer. So. I want to just sort of locate this game changer um, within a little bit of the literature and a little bit of the things that have informed my work and my thinking. We said that they're expressing themselves, the students are living out part of their lives in their L1 and in English as an L2. Um, they are, to coin the term from White and Cornu, digital residents. Digital residents, in contrast, they use this term in contrast to digital visitors. Digital residents are essentially people who are pretty much online most of the time through their mobile devices. Most of us, or many of us, are digital residents. In contrast, digital visitors are people who go to their desk, turn their laptop on, check their emails, do their Facebook, do whatever they have to do, buy their tickets, order their shopping, blah, 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 have a quick chat to somebody, turn their laptop off, off, and then get on with the rest of their lives. Many of us, many of our students are digital residents. This term, by the way, is, has pretty much replaced uh, Prensky's now dysfunctional term of, 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 uh, of um, it's just gone to me, uh, digital native immigrants, yes, of course, thank you. Digital immigrants and, 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 and so on, which, which I, I guess when it first came out was a useful thing to describe young people who, who have known nothing but technology. But increasingly, um, it's no longer about youngsters know all about it and us oldies know nothing about it. So that fortunately, we have killed the, the Prensky term finally. I think Jeremy called for that in one of his blogs a few years ago, many years ago, in fact. So digital residents. Being connected has become a part of, of who and what they are as, uh, as self and social networks have become mutually constitutive as network selves in which individuals and collective identities are simultaneously presented and promoted. We tell the world a little bit about ourselves with and through technology and often in an L2. This led Mark Pegram to come up with the idea, I, I, I link, therefore I am. <laughs> We're better connected, and the more connected we are, arguably, the better it gets. Um, that's the I those are the ideas or some of the literature that has informed my thinking and informed my work um, over the last six or seven years. Work which began with looking at what students do with technology uh, outside the classroom, why they do it, and what it means to them. And this has been a series of studies um, on independent learning in home and host countries. 
and it shows significant use of, of L2 English with digital devices, often over and above conscious learning. Let me explain. I, um, I received um, some British Council funding to do a research project um, into the ways in which um, Emirati University students and Thai University students were using digital devices outside of the classroom to help them with their English. And the research uh, methodology behind that was both quantitative and qualitative. So I gathered large samples through questionnaires and I went to talk to students. And I asked the students and through the questionnaires I asked them, what do you do with devices? Why do you do it? And what does it mean to you? All of these students um, were studying English as a minor subject in their university. First year students. So they were engineers, geographers, physicians, wh whatever it was. English was a compulsory module um, at Zayed University in the United Arab Emirates and at King Mongut University in Thailand. Their major was not English, but they were required to, 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 um, to um, study English. All of the students had access to a self-access center where there were computer-based materials to practice their language. So you could go on and you could practice the present simple, you could practice the present perfect. There were a range of, of, of software programs for practicing English. And I gathered data from these students in their home country, and that produced some interesting results, which I'll talk about in a minute. I then thought, well, maybe there's something going on here because they are in their native speaking country. And what would happen if we conducted a similar study to students in a host country at my university in, in Salford, as then was, uh, and people are coming from overseas to study in the UK? Would there be differences in what they told me about what they do with technology inside the class, uh, outside the classroom for their independent study? And then finally, I went back to Thailand to, to, to further investigate this. And here's the thing. The vast majority, not the vast majority, every single student reported that they interact with and through technology in their L1 and in English. Nobody said that they only go onto, onto the computer and use Arabic or Thai or in the UK, they only use whatever other L1 they had. They all use English as an L2 on their digital devices and on their laptops. So that was the first amazing thing. And the second amazing thing was I asked the students, what is it that helps you with your English most of all? What helps you with your vocabulary learning? What helps you with your grammar learning? What helps you with your listening skills? Is it going on to a computer-assisted language learning software program to practice the present simple? Or is it going into a commercially produced package to have a listening exercise and to listen and to then choose A, B or C? And they answered, no. Invariably, not all. Some of them said this helps and it's useful, but the vast majority said they learn English through using it with WhatsApp, through using it with Facebook, through reading stuff on the internet, through watching YouTube on the internet, through receiving comprehensible input in meaningful ways rather than consciously focusing on discrete language items. And the data was overwhelming. And then I met Stephen Krashen in the Philippines about, what was it, four, five, six years ago? I, time flies. <laughs> no, four, maybe four years ago. And we started talking about this um, and a consequence that w of that was a discussion paper in which we conclude that computer uh, assisted language learning and mobile assisted language learning is obsolete because of the things that I've described and also because of what we know about learning and unconscious acquisition. What does that mean? And why does it matter? I think it matters 
for what we do in language education in two ways. It matters at a macro level, at a bigger picture level. And I want to talk about that first of all. And I think it also matters at a micro level in terms of some of the things we can or should or might want to do with technology in our classroom. And I'm actually not a techie. This is not rocket science as I hope I will illustrate to you. So at the macro level, people living out part of their lives with and through devices in their L1 and in English as an L2 and of course in other L2s as well, though English is the, 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 the dominant one because it's the dominant language of the internet. It matters because using WhatsApp, using Facebook, using YouTube, using all these amazing things that students are doing all the time on their, on their phones brings authenticity into the language classroom. We have long argued that authenticity is a, is a good idea. Doing real stuff, real tasks, real language. In the pre-internet days, we used to bring in newspapers and magazines. Remember those days? We used to cut them up. One or two people of my generation are nodding. Some of you are looking at me thinking, what is this guy on about? Yeah, we used to buy newspapers and cut them up. And we used to cut the paragraphs up and the headlines. We used to get them to match stuff. And we did it because it was real language and it was authentic language that we were bringing in. Um, more importantly, at a macro level, the world interacts with each other primarily with and through digital devices. Most communication today is not face to face. Most communication is with devices. If our job as language practitioners is to equip people, to equip our students for the real world, then surely we, it makes sense to bring in real world activities, real world devices in order to do so. I have to have this conversation about dog me with Scott because I think that's where the argument goes wrong. <laughs> the dog me argument. So it can bring authenticity and it reflects what the world does is I think a reason why we need to embrace and think about and recognize digital self and recognize some of the implications for language education. I think it also um, informs debate about language ownership and native speaker norms. We are seeing in our profession a shift from English as a foreign language, English as a second language, to English as a lingua franca. The vast majority of users of the English language are non-native speakers of the English language. And it is their language as much as my language. Nobody owns the English language. Those days, I hope, are long since gone. And non-native speakers interacting with each other, you know, a, a, a student in Japan, a businessman in Japan communicating with a businessman or a student in Germany, they're doing it in English as a lingua franca, in a language which they own as an L2. And incidentally, the devices are also changing the language. Do you remember the early mobile phones? The texting on the early mobile phones where you had like three letters on one keypad and a number. I had a Nokia something or other, a little tiny brick. <laughs> and sending text messages through a pad which wasn't a quirky keypad meant language, you know, see you later became see you L later. It was changing language. Then people in my university said, oh, it's not English. It's not, this, this isn't matter. It served a communicative purpose. The purpose of language is communication. And all that stuff was a means to end. That's kind of disappearing a bit now because our phones have got smarter. And we started to write longer sentences once again, unless we're on Twitter. Come to Twitter shortly. Twitter 
is for me and for birds. Okay, so I think it's a factor in shifting from English as a foreign language to English as a second language. I think we need to ask ourselves, with the person sitting next to you, half a minute, is your L2 curriculum and your practice equipping students to live out a part of their lives in a foreign language with and through devices? Half a minute with the person sitting next to you. Discuss. It's a, it's a quick half minute. Would anyone like to give some feedback on that? Yes or no? Yes? How many, how, yes, no then. How many people say yes, they feel that that is happening in their practice? And how many people would say no, it's not really happening? Okay, the yeses have it and some of, a lot of people in the maybes perhaps. The macro questions I think we have to ask are, are students, so I'm developing this idea, what does that mean? Are students creating and sharing content using a variety of apps and software programs in an L2? If we're going to equip our students to function in the digitalized, connected, globalized world, can we still talk about a globalized world with Trump and Brexit? I don't know. Maybe we... Maybe we're in a post-globalized world and we're going to start building walls and barriers and, and, and in fact, no, no, let's not go there. <laughs> let's not go down that narrative. Are students creating and sharing content using a variety of apps in an L2? It seems to me we need to think about that if we're going to be equipping our students to operate functionally and successfully in English as an L2 and other L2s. And with that, because it's not all a bed of roses. I will, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into the negatives about Google Analytics and knowing everything about us and so on. I'm conscious of them, um, but I want to present essentially a, a positive picture here. Are we addressing issues of digital footprints, of online safety, of referencing skills, of the reliability of information issues, and of managing information in an L2? It seems to me, at a macro level, these are the things that we need to be thinking about. Now, I want to move on to a micro level. Digital literacy is, 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 is essential. Um, I'm the acronym buster, as Leo Sullivan once tweeted um, at, at an IATEFL conference. Um, and here's the acronyms that we have to bust before I can go on. PPP. Not my PowerPoint, it could be, it's not. As a methodology, PPP, anybody? Presentation, practice, production. The standard teaching methodology that dominates teacher training, not teacher education programs, teacher training programs, and has done for 30 years despite pitfalls. Presentation, practice, production as a methodology. Cal? Computer assisted language learning. I'm the call boy. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. 
Mal? Mobile assisted, so shifting from desktops and laptops to mobile devices. Versus TBLT, task-based language teaching, and the one that we may struggle with, mobile assisted language use, which is the acronym I'm proposing should, as an alternative to Cal and Mal. And the reason I want to talk about this at a micro level is because when I first started publishing my work a few years ago on, on the Emirati students and the Thai students and what they did and what it meant, um, people came back to me and said, oh, it's, it, it's all academic work and it's you and you lot in your ivory towers in universities producing research. It has nothing to do with me as a teacher. This is something we hear a lot of. I think there's a problem. I think there is a dysfunctional relationship between research and practice, and I'm mindful of it, and I want to address that because I think the two should be seen as complementary, not as um, uh, dichotomized problems. So I started reflecting on what my ideas um, about mobile assisted language, learn, uh, language use might mean in practice. Uh, and I came up with something which I think I would like to, which I think is a helpful way of illustrating the standard presentation practice production methodology with computer or mobile assisted language learning compared to task based language teaching and mobile assisted language use as an alternative way of thinking about how we integrate technology so that students can live out a part of their lives with and through devices in the way that I have described. Here's the working definition then of the acronym which um, was probably most problematic for you because I think you've heard of the, the, the other three. I define mobile assisted language use as non-native speakers using a variety of mobile devices in order to access and or communicate information on an anywhere, anytime basis and for a range of social and or academic purposes in their L2. So mobile assisted language use does not mean that students can't access an app to practice their grammar. That is part of it. But it's only a small part of it because we know that comprehensible input and we know that acquisition and we know that access to real language and thinking about real language works better. The research shows that and the students were telling me that that works better for them in their L2 learning. That's the working definition then. And I want to argue that we need to go to a post-Cal-Mal era of mobile assisted language use with task-based language teaching. This is some work which came after those studies which I worked on and received some inputs from Rod Ellis who you probably I'm sure are aware is kind of one of the leaders in, in, in terms of task-based language teaching. And this links to what Jeremy was saying. With task-based language teaching, we specify what people do. Rather than your aims, we're specifying what they learn. There's actually no relationship between teaching and learning. Input doesn't equal output. The plan doesn't always happen. You present, you do your plan, and then you ask your students what did they learn, and they'll tell you it's something quite different. So that's a problem. But specifying what people do is less of a problem. We say in the class, students will do this. And we anticipate language use. And we design tasks which anticipate language use. But we cannot specify what students learn. The students, different students will take different things. And the example I'm going to give you um, draws on task-based language teaching having four essential criteria. One, there is some kind of gap, an information gap. I have some information, you have some information. We have to use language to exchange that information. Two, Units, learners use their own linguistic and non-linguistic resources to do so. So the students struggle to communicate in order to exchange information. It's not a mechanical use of set formula. You, 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 yesterday, yesterday, you, you, yesterday, what you, yesterday? Oh, what you, me, me, yesterday? Do, yes, do, no, did, did. They struggle to communicate. Error can be good. 
if it leads to learning as opposed to mechanical exercise. So learners use their own linguistic and non-linguistic. There is an outcome other than the display of language and there is a focus on meaning. We're not doing things just to practice language. There is another outcome, which is an authentic outcome in order to exchange meaningful information. Language is a means to the end. Let me kind of illustrate and develop that because um, I can see one or two people looking slightly confused. That's the kind of rationale and the theory. Here's the practice. So in a presentation practice production lesson, um, we begin by setting the context and we check and then we build a dialogue, the first P, presentation. So we might say, um, where are they? At the office, okay. Um, what day is it? It's Monday, we go around, we check, where are they? Where are they? What day is it? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? We do all that, we set the scene, we set the context. What time is it? In the morning, what time is it in the morning? Hey guys, what time? There's no coffee till we get through this PPP lesson. <laughs> what time is it in the morning? It's nine o'clock. Okay. Um, what what do we think they're talking about? Monday nine o'clock. You're going to work. What are you normally talking about? The weekend. Next weekend or last weekend? Last weekend. Are they talking about the future? Are they talking about the past? La di da di da di da. We set the scene. We build the dialogue. What did you do over the weekend? What did you do over the weekend? What did you do over the weekend? We drill the dialogue. What did you do over the weekend? We drill for accuracy. We repeat, we repeat, we concept check. Where are they? Uh, uh, nothing much. We do some practice. We introduce the variables. Nothing much. You know, I listened to some music and you. Oh, I played the piano. What did you do over the weekend? Nothing much. I read a book and you, I, and then the musicians, what did you do? I played the, and we bring in all the variables. We drill them. We go for our past tense endings, played, listened, watched. We drill, we kill, we bore the students to death. They're learning mechanical dialogues. They go out the classroom and that dialogue never, ever works. Never mind all that. This is what we do. Okay. We present we practice. And then at the production stage, we say, okay, everyone get up, go around the room, talk to each other, the free practice, talk to each other, find out what five people did for the weekend. Classic idealized PPP. I admit it's idealized. It worked for me when John Saws observed me doing my Delta many years ago, rest his soul. <laughs> it got me my pass with a distinction. Okay. Show up, yes. And then, where does technology come in? Well, then we say, okay, we've done the past, the past simple tense. Um, go to this website and complete these exercises. Or there's hundreds of them. There's loads out there. They're all free. And the students practice it. And this is characterized by Warshaw and Kern as structural cal. Very structured, focusing on grammar. Okay, um, the first they identify this as the first phase of computer assisted language learning. So the students do all that, um, or perhaps they do something which is a little bit more communicative, it's a little bit more cognitive, it involves a little bit more thinking, it maybe involves students working together in pairs to have a conversation before going on to technology. So they might do something like this, which I produced way back in the day, in 20 years ago, uh, when I felt that the word processor wasn't really being harnessed enough in, in, in language education. I think that's probably still true if, you, if we think that the word processor is one of the things that most people will be using in an L2 most of the time. We don't use it that much in our classrooms uh, as a pedagogical tool, but here we go. So a little bit more in groups or in pairs, sit around the computer uh, and uh, with your partner, sit in front of the computer, look at this little text about John's exciting day and cut and paste. This was in the British Journal of, this was in the British Journal of Education Technology. That's where technology was in 1997. So the students work on that. Do you want to do it? Give me the first sentence, somebody, and we can move on. Yeah. 
Yesterday, so we, the students find the first sentence. Yesterday, John woke up at seven in the morning. They copy that, they cut that, and they put it at the beginning. And what comes next? If you don't shout out, I'm going to give you some pair work, and you're going to have to do it. And then I'm going to say to a student, stand up and read your answers. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> he got up and had a shower. la di da di da di da di da Okay. He's a good student. He needs to go up into the intermediate class <laughs> because he's clearly got the past simple tense. The rest of you, you've got four more weeks in this class, you know. Okay. Okay. So cognitive cal. The students are working in pairs. They're manipulating a text. It's a little bit more meaningful than the previous example, but it's still using the computer to consciously um, focus on um, language learning. So, if we think about an alternative approach to this, a simple alternative approach to that standard that I've presented to you of task-based language teaching and mobile assisted language use, it might look something like this. On Friday, we say to our students, okay, have a nice weekend, and over the weekend, take your mobile phones and take five or six pictures of, the, some, of some of the most exciting things that you did over the weekend. We don't want hundreds of pictures of this is me sleeping, this is me watching television, this is me listening to my radio. Okay, Five or six of the most exciting things you did over the weekend. Go away, take some pictures and bring them back to class. The pre-task. Monday morning, we set up the task. We say, depending on the level of the group, the size of the group, we say, okay, you've got 20 minutes. Take your phones out, show other people in the group what you did, tell them what you did, it's a task, find out what they did, and then, when you've done that, sit in groups and decide who had the most exciting weekend. During the task, of course, the teacher's going around, listening, making notes, picking up on errors, picking up on things that need input. So our input is based on the problems that the students are having with language rather than that predetermined input with PPP. If they've got the past tense endings, we don't teach it. So then students use devices in class. There's a focus on meaning. Weekends, people talk about what they did at the weekend all the time. There's a gap. I have some information about what I did, you have some information about what you did. That's the gap. We use linguistic and non-linguistic language to exchange information. You, you, weekend. You mean, you mean me, me, weekend, I am, I am? No, 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 no. What you, what, what do you, what do you, what did you do? And they get it, it comes with practice and with struggle and with input from others. There is an outcome other than the display of language. It's really crucial for Ellis. It's not, we're not just doing it to practice language. We're doing it, language is a means to end. We're doing it so the students can find out who had the most exciting weekend. It's a kind of authentic thing that our, our students might well want to do. I went to watch Manchester United, all sorts of things, and it allows for unpredictable language. And we're anticipating language use. The syllabus is arguably the same. It's using the past simple tense to describe completed actions. The methodology is different. The technology is different. It's still a product-based syllabus. It's still language functions. With PPP, there's assumption that input equals output. Students generated output. With task-based language teaching, the students generate. We turn the pyramid the other way. Is it the PPP, presentation, practice, production, with task base, we start with the production. We've, we've turned the pyramid on its head. There's a focus on form. PPP, fixed dialogue, controlled interaction. Task based teaching, student generated dialogues, interaction. There's authenticity. It's a kind of thing our students are likely to need to do. With education technology, the role of technology and digital self, there's very little digital self in the PPP. Just using a, a, a language learning exercise to practice, which we know from the research, um, our students 
don't find particularly helpful, and we know that it doesn't necessarily help with language acquisition anyway. With the task-based language teaching lesson, there's language use, social media. After the class, of course, they can, we can have a closed group on Facebook. They can put their pictures up, and there can be an ongoing conversation about weekend. I went to a Chinese restaurant. Was it expensive? What did you eat? Da -da 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 -da. Oh, I think so -so was more exci more exciting weekend. He went to a wedding. Ba 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 ba. We're encouraging students to live out their lives with and through devices. We're reflecting um, things that they are likely to need to do in the real world once the classroom context is over. Okay, for this section, I'm going to move on briefly to talk about um, what technology might mean for digital, for professional self and us as language teachers. But for this section, um, his little visual which I tickled my fancy, and it's mobile assisted language use in English for academic purposes. And um, you're probably thinking, oh, it's going to be this sort of dry EAP text. Um, and here's a classic example, it's a real picture, in an EAP classroom um, of mobile assisted language use. Why are we teaching traditional note-taking skills? <laughs> the slides will be on a virtual learning environment, Blackboard or, or, or Moodle or whatever. Um, students can take the slides here. Do we still teach directions where we get students to have maps, paper maps, and we cross out the post office on one map and we cross out and we, <laughs> and we cross out the church on the other map and we get them to get these papers? Do we still do that? Do we need to do that? Do we still get, do we still get people to bring in paper dic dictionaries? Or do, do we get them to harness and use the stuff that's out there in appropriate, effective, efficient ways? So, um, as I said, uh, several years into this work, having gone through this journey of looking at what people do with mobile devices, what it means to them, having reflected on traditional understandings of computer-assisted language learning and mobile-assisted language learning and, and thinking there's something missing here, um, having published about what we need to be doing at a global level, at a, a, at a syllabus level, a, a bigger picture level, if you like, and then thinking about, hang on, I, I want to talk to the, my MA TESOL students who are saying, ah, it's all ivory tower research, what does it mean? And coming up with the idea of mobile assisted language use and task-based teaching. Having gone through all of that and having um, spent eight years developing my website, tesolacademic.org, um, I began in the recent sort of couple of years to focus much more on um, professional self and how we as teachers present ourselves, how we interact with the world, how we access information with and through um, digital devices. And for the remaining part of the talk, I want to briefly touch on that for the next 10 minutes or so, and then I promise to um, relieve you to go out for some coffee. Um, there is a session on Saturday where I'll talk about this in more detail. And if you bring your devices, we can do some hands-on stuff. And if you try some of it before then, come to the session and we can share and have conversations about it. So this is a kind of taster of what's coming on Saturday with one task that I would like to, or I would, I would encourage you to do um, within the next hour or so. Professional self and teachers then. Here we have a very traditional sort of classroom scenario. Um, teachers encouraging each other, talking about stuff. And continuing professional development, lifelong learning, um, are one aspect of our professional self. Part of who and what we are is going to meetings and sharing and discussing and learning. We, 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 as teachers, we are always learning, aren't we? I think it's an important lesson for us. We, we, you, know, you don't say, I'm qualified, that's it now. So I'm qualified, but hey, but what about this? Or that doesn't work. Or have you read this latest insight? Or, or so-and-so says we should do it this way. We're, we're, we're developing and we're, it's an ongoing 
journey. So it's with us in all that we say and all that we do. And continuing professional development may or may not manifest itself in a traditional staff meeting. It depends on your context. Some staff meetings um, can be very focused on the developmental side of things, whether, whereas others are much more procedural. Have you hit your target? What's happened to little Johnny? He's not attending anymore. Whereas others are, um, okay, how are we going to go about teaching these aspects of the curriculum? These are the sort of traditional approaches then. Formally, continuing professional development is usually channeled through in-service training days and occasionally through conferences like this. I guess we are all here because we want to develop in some way, shape or form. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. So conferences, great way. Our face-to-face -face networks comprise other staff participants, trainers, speakers. Um, I love face-to-face. -face. I love meeting teachers. I love going to workshops. I love conference events. And I'm not saying that in an online environment, it has to be one or the other. But I am certainly saying that in an online environment, social media in particular offers us affordances over and above coming to events like this. I want to illustrate some of those briefly um, with you. Digital Professional Self, new acronym DPS. Manifests itself in what we choose to do and not in our, C uh, uh, what we choose to do and not do in our CPD as teachers in an online environment. So we make choices about what we access online, how we access it, when we access it, the extent to which we do or do not engage in it. There's this idea of um, lurking on the internet when you follow stuff but you don't engage, which is fine. Or you can actively engage if you wish, of course. But the point is, we have the choice. Uh, who we share and interact with, act with forms part of our personal learning networks. So. The critical point here is it's not just students who live out part of their lives in an online environment. It's us as teachers to a greater or lesser extent. Unlike face to face, it's not location specific. You can do this CPD in an online environment anywhere, anytime. You, you may want to problematize that, as, as, as my wife does quite often when she's trying to talk to me over dinner and I'm just saying, oh, I've just got another tweet about this conference. Uh, Eric's just said I need to tweet it, well, I'll be back to you. So we, we can problematize these things, but it's anywhere, anytime, and it's up to us. Sometimes it's not time specific, so asynchronous stuff. We post stuff and then we go away and do other stuff and then we come back to it. Sometimes, of course, it's online and it's synchronous. Uh, it allows us to choose what content to access and let's face it, attending conferences, we love it, but it's never cheap attending conferences, you know. I think it's, it's well spent money, but there's, we, we all have limited budgets and we can't attend 10 conferences a year. And a lot of that can be mitigated in an online environment. It's usually not one or the other. Here's a tip I would give, which I learned pretty early on when I got into this. Separate the professional and the personal. I used to have one Twitter account. And as some of you who follow me on Twitter know, I, I can tend to rant. Sometimes. About things in language education, but about other stuff too. I rant about Brexit. I rant about the mighty Leeds United failing to get in a playoff yet again. I rant about the President of the United States. And I found that people who are interested in those rants are not necessarily interested in what I have to say about teacher education. So I've separated at TESOL Academic is my Twitter feed for professional stuff and at Hugh Jarvis is all the rest of it. I think it's a useful thing to do um, in terms of building up followers and developing networks. So there's going to be more on this on Saturday. Let's just spend um, the next five minutes. Ten, then I've got, got five more minutes more. Thank you. Let's spend the next 10 minutes. Sorry, guys, the coffee's going to have to wait 10 minutes, not five minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes going through um, some, some of the things to give you a taster. 
So digital professional self on Facebook. How many of you are on Facebook? Can you put your hands up? Whoa, okay, okay. How many participants use Facebook for their continuing professional development as teachers? Okay, I would say about 25% of the people who put their hands up for being on Facebook use it in their professional practice. So I'd encourage you to look at the huge opportunities that are out there on Facebook. And we'll look at these on Saturday. There's things like the Ayatefel um, group. If you search on Facebook, Ayatefel, there are the special interest groups. My own group, TESOL Academic, we've got 12,000 members. It's a closed group. It's a moderated group. And we have conversations about things in language education and things that, things that, things that matter. Some of them you just like, some you follow, some you join. Some Facebook groups are set up for specific events. There's a Facebook group for this symposium. How many of you are aware of a Facebook group for this symposium? Put your hand up if you visited it. Great. Okay. One third. We need to work on the other two thirds next time. Is it going to be a next time? Say yes. <laughs> you might, you're allowed to say never again, by the way. <laughs> Um, it's not what Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp or, um, or, or, or YouTube, many of them um, cross over. So there's an Ayatefel, um, TESOL Academic, um, tweet, Twitter feed. We'll look at some of those. Uh, blogs and webinars. How many of you have particip how many participants have a language education blog? How many of you have your own blog? I know Jeremy does. Anyone else blog? Three or four. Okay. How many read language education blogs? Just over half, I'd say. How many of you read them and participate? So you put a comment. That's interesting, isn't it? About half of you go on the blogs and about 10% of those actually add things. So I think one of the challenges is um, to go from Web 1 dissemination models, where we just access information, to Web 2 interactive stuff, where we can say something and we can comment on what somebody else says and they'll get back to us and so on. Um, Jeremy's already given Scott a plug. Here's another plug for him. Um, you can follow him on Twitter. We'll look at his A to Z um, uh, of, 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 of ELT and we'll look at his A to Z blog of ELT. Uh, K is for... He's on the blog and then there's a long conversation about the ex some of it positive, some of it negative <laughs> about Krashen's work. And it's a great way to have those conversations and to discuss um, as our webinars. Moving on. Okay, so here's, um, this is from my YouTube channel. And I just, I, one of the things I do is I get well, highly regarded scholars in the field, such as Stephen, such as many others, to give talks, YouTube talks about their work. Um, so, you know, we've got Rod Ellis here, on, he's had 12,000 views, and Stevens is one of the largest, he's had 16,000 views, and he, we did this in, in, in the Philippines a few years ago, uh, and we post it on the YouTube channel, and if you can't see that at the back, he talks about comprehensible input, explicit teaching methods, and loads, loads more interesting stuff. And if we look at that one video, 16,000 views, you probably can't read some of that. There is then a conversation under that about the talk. So yes, spread this information via the internet. Internet. This is commenting on Stephen's talk. Children should not spend their time for test preparation. Japanese kids are always afraid of being tested. A lot of comprehensible input with low effective filter. And so on. This is an interesting story about the talking bird Cosmo. Keep up the good fight, Dr. Krashen. And there's a conversation. The point being, we don't just access information, but we have opportunities to engage in information and develop our professional practice and skills. How are we doing on time? Five more minutes. Okay. So we'll look at some of that in further detail. I want to conclude by talking a little bit about Twitter. And there's a reason that I'm uh, towards the front of the plenary talks. And that's because I want to encourage you and all of us to engage in Twitter throughout this conference, if I could twist your arms. Some of you are already doing so, if you look at the hashtag, but not, it's a small minority. So the question is, what has, it, what has Twitter ever done for us as teachers? 
You know, I'm in a coffee shop, it's nice. What has Twitter done for us as teachers? Apart from connecting us to hundreds and thousands of other teachers. What has Twitter ever done for us as teachers, apart from allowing us to share articles, to share Facebook posts, to blog, to share YouTube talks, to share webinars? What has Twitter ever done for us as teachers, apart from providing a space for synchronous conversations, such as ELT chat every Wednesday, where teachers tweet to this hashtag and have conversations about their practice and share ideas about our practice? What has Twitter ever done for, for us as teachers, apart from forcing us to think clearly, think simply? If you can't say it in a tweet, you probably don't understand it. Well, that's contested, isn't it, really? <laughs> Jeremy's task is Shakespeare in a tweet. All of Shakespeare's works in a tweet to be, to be posted by the end of the conference. <laughs> Not now. Apart from giving us 24-7 continuing professional development, what has Twitter ever done for us? Apart from giving us hashtags such as Hashtag TESOL, the modern foreign language one, MFL Twitterati, or MFL, to reach as many followers. If you tweet to hashtags, you reach not just the people that are following you, but anybody who, um, who's looking at that hashtag. So you can network not just with 10 or 50 or 100 or 1,000 followers, but with hundreds of thousands of followers. Here's where I want to twist your arms a little bit and encourage you to try it. If, if, if you try it and you don't get it, and you try it for a few weeks and you keep at it for a few weeks and you say, no, no it's not for me, that's, that's, that's fine. But you won't, you can't make an informed choice until you've tried it. When you've tried it, you'll then be able to say, it's not for me or wow, it's amazing. So start now. Get your phones out. You've got free Wi-Fi. Download a Twitter app. If not this minute, then in the next hour. Download Twitter. Open an account on your smartphone. Do it in the next hour so that we can start to have conversations, even in the face-to-face. -face. We're, we're not gonna, probably not going to get a chance to talk to every single one of you here. Probably talk to two-thirds of you. And the third I don't talk to, we can have conversations with each other. Download Twitter on your smartphone. Follow my account, at Tiesel Academic. Follow the guy in the corner there at the back, at Stephen Crashen. Follow others. Chris has got a, an account. Look at the people we follow and follow them. Look at who's tweeting to this conference hashtag and follow them. It's Hugh in, Hugh Della. Hugh tweets well. Follow the people that are giving talks. Then compose a tweet, compose a question, compose an observation about this talk or about Jeremy's talk or about anything else and tweet your composition to this hashtag, ILSB17. This is our community. Tweet a tweet and include it in there. I don't, even if you say Jarvis speaks rubbish most of the time, that's fine. Maybe. No, that's fine. We'll have a conversation about it. I will help, and others in this room will, I'm sure, help build your online community by retweeting some of the things that you are tweeting and replying to things that you are saying and replying to questions. We're gonna, the great thing about this symposium is we're going to have a chance to sit around and have conversations. We can extend those conversations beyond the hour or half hours that we have. and We can have ongoing conversations throughout the conference by tweeting to the conference hashtag.
I'm going to develop a lot of this on Saturday when we do some more hands-on stuff about some of these continuing professional development ideas for teachers. I can't remember what time I'm on. I think it's 11 o'clock. It's in the program. Um, come along to the workshop. Um, if there's something else that grabs your attention and you can't come to the workshop, then there's a free task sheet on tcelacademic.org which encourages teachers to start getting into social media for continuing professional development. I ask you to watch a YouTube talk and to copy the link and to tweet it and to put a comment on Facebook and to start to build up your um, continuing professional development in an online um, environment. There are huge opportunities for us to live out our professional selves with and through our devices and with and through social media. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in my work, you can visit the website tcelacademic.org. Uh, the references are, are, are up there. Many of these are available as open access articles. These days I only publish in open access. I, nobody owns knowledge and nobody should have to pay to access research. If you have to pay, I don't publish it any, anymore. So the vast majority of these are open access. Um, if they're not, it's from an era when, 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 when my line managers at the university said, you got to publish in this journal. Those days are, for, are fortunately gone for me and for you <laughs> and so much the better for it uh, so um, have a look at those have a look at the website if you're interested in, in, in my work and those papers uh, and don't forget the hashtag and thank you very much for your attention